What's shaking, everybody? You're listening to Improv Tabletop, the Fate RPG actual play where we make up everything on the spot. I'm Ned Wilcock, your host and GM, and today I'm joined by... Connor Wood, local deodorant enthusiast. Caleb Anderton, local weirdo. And Thomas Brower, not a pesticide. <laughs> mm. Well, everybody, here's Thomas's wonderful introduction to the show that we've been promising you. <laughs> we told you that he was going to get on here eventually, and now here he is. He's here, guys. Came out swinging. And I have confirmed I'm not a pesticide, so we're starting things out great. Check that off the list. That's a load off my mind, I will tell you. <laughs> Just spitting truths out here, folks. <laughs> spitting truths. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, guys, we've got a new setting for you this month. Brand new story, brand new campaign. Uh, this month's suggestion setting comes to us from Mitchell Brazga on Facebook, Woo-woo! who suggested a wonderful cult classic film and comic book series, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which is a film that I was super, super into in high school, so <laughs> I am stoked that we're getting to do it. Give me just a second. My cat's going to ruin my lighting setup. <laughs> Are you feline intrusion? Don't you hate when you're listening to a good podcast and you can just tell the lighting's off? <laughs> that always messes me up. It spoils the mood, that's for sure. While he's gone, we should talk about how cool he is. Ned's amazing, yeah. guys. Like, you like, seen his big muscles and his smart head? <laughs> and heard his music? Oh, uh, yeah, it's just so inspiring. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we're back. Uh, So we've got the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and the thing that we're mashing that up with this month is cartoons. Just nice, classic, slapstick animations. And so we're going to start this month off, as we always do, with some ideations. We're just going to tell some real stories about our real lives that will help to inform the world we create and how our characters act in that world. So I'll go ahead and start us off. Uh, I already mentioned that I was a very big fan of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen movie back in high school. That was like what I knew Sean Connery from. Not from James Bond, not from Indiana Jones, not from Entrapment. Like to me, Sean Connery was Alan Quartermain. And that kind of has a strong tie-in with my introduction to tabletop gaming. I talked about this a little bit on iCast Fireball, our sister podcast. We would kind of switch off who was the GM in our games, and whenever I would run a story, it was usually some kind of mashup of classical literature. Uh, For those of you who aren't familiar with the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, I should probably explain. It's kind of like the Avengers or the Justice League, except all of the heroes are characters from classical literature. So I would do campaigns that were like, maybe it would start out as The Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe and shift into The Cask of Amontillado, also by Edgar Allan Poe. Or I think the longest one that I did was it started out as Moby Dick and turned into 20,000 Leagues Beneath the Sea. Uh, The one that I think I ran the most times was it started out as The Beast in the Cave by H.P. Lovecraft and then turned into like a combination of The Isle of Dr. Moreau and The Most Dangerous Game. So my, my roots in geekdom are strongly steeped in classic literature and hopefully I don't let myself down during this campaign. Um, As far as cartoons go, we mostly watched PBS when I was growing up, so lots of educational stuff. Cyber Chase, Word Girl, that sort of stuff. (laughs) Yeah, that's good times. Gilbert Gottfried, Christopher Lloyd, how they managed to get those people, I have no idea. (laughs) But what a show. But the only other thing that I'd like to say about cartoons is I just want to state in front of the world that Freakazoid is my favorite superhero of all time. Even living in a modern era in which the popular eye is all saturated with superheroes, to this day, Freakazoid, the super teen extraordinaire himself, is my favorite superhero. Don't at me. (laughs) That rules so hard. I just want to say, Ned, you have one of the most well-versed teenage years that I've ever heard of. of All these (laughs) classic literature just stories. I mean... On top of Freakazoid. On top of Freakazoid. It's astounding. (laughs) And Cyber Chase. Yeah, I was was definitely an introverted child growing up. (laughs) Enough about that. Connor, you got anything for us? Yes. Man, cartoons in League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. When I first saw this, I was in my middle school days. And that was back before I was like barely sentient as a human being. I was still just kind of <laughs> going through the motions and like riding the school bus because my mom told me to. 
And I remember seeing this movie one day. We either rented it from Blockbuster or just had it on DVD. It was, gosh, 2000. Three. What a weird time for movies. Um, I did watch it ten times, and I don't remember any of it. But I do remember the feeling of seeing Sean Connery's little little hand stick out of the ground and think, wow, what a guy. And then later learning that that was the last thing he ever did because he hated filming it so much. Oh. Anyway, I like Sean Connery, and I like his little grubby mitt sticking out of the ground. <laughs> spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert for The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen that never got a sequel. Maybe someday. <laughs> this, maybe the popularity of this campaign will finally get us that LXG sequel. Yeah. <laughs> Caleb. What you got for us? Um, yeah, not too much on the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I remember watching it once. I also remember that I was, like, sick at the time. Like, I was at home throwing up. It had been lent to me by somebody, and I was like, I guess I w I'll watch this. And I don't remember any of it at all, either. So that's a, that's a common theme, I guess. Well, we're one for three so far. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but out of those people that I know are in it, like, man, Captain Nemo. Captain Nemo is one of my favorite literary characters of all time. But that's not what I actually want to talk about. I want to talk about cartoons. Because, guys... Cartoons are kind of my life hmm. a little bit. I, I, guys, I can seriously talk about this for like an hour. I don't get why so many people view cartoons as like kid show stuff. There is so much out there that is like just a good show or just a good movie and a good story. And it just happens to be animated. And for me, that's like an extra level of art added to it. Hmm. Like, oh, it's so good. Go watch some good cartoons, but specifically, I wanted to talk about my favorite cartoon ever and probably the thing that made me want to become a voice actor in the first place is the animated Winnie the Pooh TV series. Yes. The <laughs> new adventures of Winnie the Pooh that ran from like the late 80s, early 90s. That was absolutely amazing. I remember having those on VHS at my home. I would watch those all the time. And man, Tigger, Tigger's just my favorite. Tigger is the bomb. <laughs> man, such a good show. I still watch that with my kids. Thank heavens for Disney Plus. Not a sponsor, but Disney Plus is amazing because you get to watch all that old stuff. Welcoming sponsorship. Yes, I've gone all over the board here. That's it. Winnie the Pooh, Tigger, Captain Nemo, all the good stuff. Can I chime in with a small interlude about Captain Nemo? Uh, I just want to say there is one line I remember that Captain Nemo says. He's, he's surrounded by like nine dudes with machine guns and they're like, draw your pistol. And he's like, I do not walk that path. And he, then he draws a sword and beats all of them. Heck yes. He's nine guys with machine gun <laughs> with a little sword because he's Captain Nemo. Nice. Uh, to build on Caleb's comment about people being all like, cartoons are for kids, there's this great quote by C.S. Lewis, something to the effect of, a children's story that can only be enjoyed by children is not a good children's story in the slightest. Mm -hmm. This coming from the man who wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So definitely agree with you on that. I mentioned during our Avatar one-shot that it's been my favorite show for years, very much for that reason. And after he wrote that quote... He just slowly put on shades over his eyes and he just walked out of the <laughs> lecture hall that he was in. He invented the mic and then he dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thomas, tell us more about uh, your experience with children's stories via cartoon and or LXG. Man, LXG, what can I say? Other than I have not seen it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I... I <laughs> I, I have not been able to partake of that, uh, unfortunately, but I probably will now after this. Uh, but I can speak to cartoons. It seems there seems to be a overall theme here on cartoons. One of the biggest ones uh, sticking out in my mind, uh, in addition to Avatar, in addition to Winnie the Pooh growing up, but the animated adventures of Batman or Batman the Animated mm. Series mm. growing up as a kid terrified me, but as an adult, still kind of terrified me actually but 
had just such a stronger, deep appreciation of like what you could do with cartoons and being able to tell those stories in that medium. And so, yeah, there's just so many uh, amazing stories that have been told through cartoons that I've really enjoyed and still watch cartoons to this day. And now that I've got two of my kids, I can share with them the joys of the wit that is actually in Phineas and Ferb and <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, the wit that is actually in Avatar and things like that. Uh, it's just uh, a good time all around. Yeah, I haven't seen a whole bunch of the early Batman the Animated Series stuff, but I watched The Mask of the Phantasm with some friends a while back. Oh, Mask of the Phantasm. It was so amazing. It's quite good. All right. Well, we've got a nice pool of ideas that we can draw from. So now let's start talking about what our world is going to be like. So we're going to have characters drawn from all over the place, from classic literature. So this world that we're creating, there needs to be some sort of reason for them to be gathering together. And I'm wondering, do we go with like a Space Jam collision of cartoon worlds kind of vibe here? A Roger Rabbit almost, or Space Jam? Or like uh, all of these different people sucked into a cartoon somehow via, you know, the Page Master. Or... I was gonna throw out Page Master. I'm there we all... go. Always thinking of there we our go. little Macaulay Culkin boy. I mean, speaking of cartoons that terrified you when you were a kid. Oh my god! Oh yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. The fear of drowning in the library never was a thing until oh. I saw that movie. <laughs> I couldn't even read or understand Doctor Jekyll or Mister Hyde <laughs> for most of my adult life, still to this day, because of that movie. All right, so we've got a pretty visceral reaction from Page Master, so I think <laughs> that's the direction we're going to be going. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, start getting our care characters put together then. Um, it's going to be interesting in that, you know, presumably we're going to have characters that kind of already exist, but we're each going to have our own fun spins on them, I am sure. So, uh, does anybody have a particularly strong concept that they'd like to start off with? I do. I'm just gonna start. I'm gonna do it. Dive in. So I know I just mentioned the idea of like sucked into a cartoon, but I'm going with somebody who's already a bit of a cartoon character. Not a bit of one. He is one. Um, <laughs> I think the high concept aspect that most people would be most familiar with is I'm the only one. All right, I'm gonna bust out a little trigger <laughs> definition here oh, that not many people get to see or hear, but you guys are all gonna get to see and hear it this entire time because we're bringing out a Tigger into these with these. Powerful. <laughs> well, you know what's great about this? Tigger was a classic literary character long before he was a cartoon. That's right. So there you go. Yeah, he's basically almost public domain, so let's do uh, this. I mean, probably and. Plus, this is the whole thing of we're portraying classic characters. This is under parody law, probably. <laughs> yep. If comic books could do it, we can do it. All right. So our high concept aspect, I'm the only one. What would we like to define as Tigger's trouble? I mean, he's got a lot of them, to be sure. Uh, but what would you like to focus on? Well, you know, Tigger's just bouncing around and meeting all his friends and just trying so hard to be a likable guy. But he's a little bit, you know, clumsy and, you know, he tries too hard a little bit. Maybe that's it. Trying too hard is his troubles. Very nice. Now, this is where things are going to get really interesting for Tigger, because we're going to go with our audience-generated aspect <laughs> here. Oh, boy. So, would you like to have... Weirdly likes spiders. The glass is always 100% glass. Or I blame my ex wife. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> This is the origin story we needed. <laughs> Tigger starring Walking Phoenix. <laughs> oh, do I dare? You know, um, I don't know if I dare. I'll leave that dare to somebody else. I'm going with the glass is always 100% glass. All right. So now we've got all of Tigger's aspects figured out. What would you like Tigger's peak approach to be? Oh, I'm looking at all of them, and it's not necessarily a bouncy approach, because that would be the best one. But I'm thinking he's pretty flashy. That sounds very on brand, yes. He's a flashy kind of guy. And then for a stunt, what do you think would be either a cool ability for Tigger to have or a cool piece of equipment? I think we're just going to go with a classic of the world's bestest bouncer. So at any point, if there's something real high... Uh, yeah, and I need to bounce up there. I can just do it. I can bounce really high. Nice. And that is our good friend Tigger. Amazing. 
Amazing, Caleb. Now, Thomas or Connor, do either of you guys have a good idea for us? I got one. What you got, Connor? So, my name is Ari, and I'm King Triton's daughter. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I go by Ari. Full name is Ariel Oceana Montgomery Aquatica, but you can just call me Ari. <laughs> I'm a fun-loving swimming girl who just wants to be up on the land with the people doing what they do up there. Nice. My life just feels two-dimensional, you know? Indeed. Uh, <laughs> what would you say is a good high-concept aspect for Ari? Um, hmm. A fish out of water? Fish out of water is good. <laughs> fish out of water is stupid good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just like a fish out of water. Just like I feel like I haven't found my pond yet. My pond is land. <laughs> nice. What's something that gets Ari in trouble on occasion? I do rob human beings. <laughs> I do rob them. Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Straight up crime. Yeah, if I get the chance to, if there's not too many people on a boat, I will drown them and I will take their things. <laughs> My father does not appreciate this, but I think of it as a way of uh, self-expression. And um, I have been grounded a few times because of it. My trouble is I rob people, but I'm not above <laughs> killing them as well. I'm not a bad person, but I'm also not going to be a good person. Nice. <laughs> now, the aspects that you will get to choose from. Strong but butter fingers. Bigfoot saw me, but nobody believes me. <laughs> or Mr. Punchy and Mr. Slappy always have my back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Punchy and Mr. Slappy always have my back. That's what I call my fist and my tail. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to have like Ursula's eels be part of you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Punchy and Mr. Who? Who's the other guy? Mr. Slappy. Slappy. Because, you know, when you're robbing and killing all of these people on their boats, you need to have some, some tools of the trade. Yeah. Now, what is Ari's peak approach going to be? You know what? I want to gravitate back towards careful because I'm actually kind of sick of getting into trouble. Mm. So maybe you're you're like on the reform. You're on the men. Yeah. You've killed and robbed a few too many innocent sailors and daddy's really, really unhappy with you. Maybe it's time to go clean. Yeah. I just I wanted their stuff. Um, I wanted their lives too, but I wanted their stuff mostly. <laughs> anyway, stunt. Yeah, what you got in mind? I was thinking, um, want to see this thing I can do with my tail. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> hey, that, that could apply for Tigger too. <laughs> so good. No, I think my stunt will be good thing I brought my dingle hopper. Oh, nice. Yep. The dingle hopper, it gives me kind of, you know, similarly to the intergalactic mop, kind of a sonic screwdriver kind of vibe. Yeah, this one's a bit more uh, archaic, but I think there's still still a natural beauty that comes from it. Yes, of course. All right, there is Ari. And last up, we got Thomas. What you got in mind for us? With all these literary characters that Disney eventually just bought up, <laughs> I feel like I have to create a literary character that was eventually eaten by... Uh, the machine. I mean, the machine. Uh, I, <laughs> so if you were to take a look at my character, you know, coming down the road, because... They're not always on the go, but they're always out for a good time. They're uh, strolling down the promenade, if you will, and they've got their cane they're walking with. They've got a cute little tuxedo, but they only have the top of the tuxedo and a little top hat on top of their um, massive head. And where you would think I would have feet, I would have fins. And you would see this gigantic white sperm whale walking down the street. Yeah. Yeah. As, as Moby Dick is looking looking to be a VIP at your your venue tonight. <laughs> Thank goodness. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. Well, I was going to say talk about a fish out of water, but whales aren't fish. <laughs> uh, so for my high concept, I, uh, you know, I would say probably like uh, he's on his way. He's on mm. his, you know, I'm on my way to your venue, to on the up and up. I'm on my way. Moby Dick's moving up in life. He's going to become, you know, the greatest at whatever it is that he's trying to do. Murdering sailors. Mm. Oh, okay. I hear you. <laughs> Good thing it's not trying to be a musician because there's already a Moby in that arena. <laughs> and I think we know who's going to lose in that situation. So we've got our high concept aspect for Moby Dick. What's something that gets Moby Dick in trouble on occasion? I would think he's a bit of a show-off. 
you know, he, uh, where, where there's danger, he's not gonna, like, steer away from that. You know, he's gonna go to it because, uh, he's expecting to perform for these people. Like, uh, you know, Captain Ahab, he had sharp objects, but, you know, I, I kept going back. And, uh, so, you know, he's, he's, he's a bit of a show off, I would say. Mm, yeah. When you've got that much uniqueness going on for you, it's kind of hard not to want to flaunt it. You get me. All 52 feet of it. Mm. <laughs> you get me. <laughs> Now, for an additional aspect, here's what you get to choose from for Moby Dick. Two fries short of a Happy Meal. (laughs) I can always bat my eyes. (laughs) Or... Good thing magic exists. <laughs> I mean, I already have. I like to show off. So uh, I'm actually going to go with uh, two fries short of a Happy Meal. All right. And for a peak approach, uh, which of these approaches do you think most describes Moby Dick? Well, I was going to do clever, but with two fries short of a Happy Meal. I don't know if that fits anymore. So, so I would say flashy. Yeah, nice. definitely flashy. And a very show-offy whale over here. I stand out. Indeed. And for a stunt, uh, what is something cool that Moby Dick can do or maybe a cool bit of equipment that he has? Uh, I want to call this stunt uh, There She Blows. Mm-hmm. And the idea of like, uh, I seem to be able to get out of like unique situations or where, where it seems that I'm beat or I'm caught or I'm surrounded uh, there she blows. Maybe if there's some sort of like water around, uh, I can jump in the water and escape somehow. Interesting. The white whale is elusive. That is why we have the metaphor of the white whale. And I'm instantly thinking of Ron Burgundy right now. <laughs> I hate metaphors. That's why my favorite book is Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've got our three characters, Tigger, Ari, and Moby Dick. What is going to happen? I have no idea, but we're going to find (laughs) out. So we begin at the local library where the high school's biggest dweeb, Dexter Douglas, the mild-mannered alter ego of Freakazoid, has decided to do a little bit of studying after school. Uh, It's the best place to go to use a new computer. Uh, They are very newfangled and very fancy. They've even got some that have screens, like CRT displays at the library. So he's very excited to maybe even log onto the internet. (laughs) So while he's there, however, he's kind of walking through the stacks of books, perusing to try and find something that'll help him get a bit more acquainted with the computer ways. And as he's scanning through the spines of the books, a noise appears off to the side. And he flips out a little bit because he's Dexter Douglas and very mild-mannered. He's like, "Uh, hello, what's going on? And he looks around the corner of the bookshelf, and one of the books is hopping up and down on the shelf, making a rattling noise as it does. So he walks up and he's like, well, this is very unusual. I haven't heard of anything like this. Pulls the book off of the shelf, and it is The Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Yes. That's a good book. And as he begins to flip it open, the leaves of the page, the leaves, the pages, the pages of the book begin to whip back and forth violently. And something comes springing out of the book. (laughs) Well, how's it going, my buddy old pal? What's your name? My name's Tigger. It's really good to see you. Where the heck are we, huh? Oh, goodness. I've never seen anything like you before. Well, I have seen you in cartoons, but never actually in real life. Of course you never seen me. It's because I'm the only one. Now, what was your name? You didn't tell me that part. Uh, a De- Dexter. Dexter Douglas. Dexter Douglas! What a fantastical name! Okay, uh, maybe I'm going a little bit crazy. Um, oh, goodness. Well, the, the library's about to close. Uh, we should probably... And then the lights shut off, and you hear the front door close and lock. And Dexter Douglas goes, oh, goodness. Oh, boy. Um, we, we might need to try and find our way out of this place. Hey, it's kind of spooky in here. Uh, yes, it's, it's very spooky, in fact. And I need to get home so that I can have my warm milk and cookies before bed because I need to go to bed at 9.30 precisely every night or else I have really bad dreams. Oh, boy, do I get you there. I get the nightmares sometimes about spookables and jaculars. Oh, I don't know anything about that, but I watched The Page Master once and holy cow, I couldn't sleep for like months after that. <laughs> Gasp! That's 
it's the most scariest movie I've ever seen in my little life. Okay, well, you know, come on, come on, Tigger. Maybe we can find uh, some way out of here. And as he turns, he's like, he's got his face back towards you as he's walking and he trips over a shelving cart and two more books go falling off and they are both very aquatic in nature. It seems that you found yourself in the nautical stories section of the library. And these two books, as they slide off the shelving cart, they hit the ground and flip open. And as they do, torrents of water start spilling out of these books. And on those torrents of water are two very unusual finned creatures. Whoa, what's going on? Whoa, hey, where is this books? Books are getting wet. They're not going to work anymore. You, cowering child, where are we? Oh, goodness. Uh, you're in the library at the moment, uh, the library at Harry Connick Junior High School, and we need to try and get out of here as quickly as we can, um, or else, I'll, like you said, all these books are going to get just obliterated to pieces. Blown to tangerines! And he turns around as if he's heading towards the exit, and he slams right into the massive bulk of Moby Dick and looks up at you and almost faints. Oh, <laughs> Will. Hello there, my good man. As he looks at me and I'm... Water is just streaming off of my uh, giant whale body <laughs> with uh, Captain Ahab yelling in the background. <laughs> um, like, oh my, I seem to have uh, found myself a new venue to peruse. <laughs> Will. And Dexter's looking around at all three of you and he clutches his head and he's like spinning around trying to grasp what's going on. He's like, this is too much. I, I don't understand what's going on. I think I'm starting to freak out. And with a shock of lightning, he goes flying all around the library, bouncing off walls, bouncing off bookshelves. He goes into the screen of the computer and as he comes back out, he is wearing a tight red jumpsuit, white gloves, his skin is blue, hair slicked back in a black shock with a lightning bolt on the side and he goes oh my it's been such a long time that I've been stuck in that old dweeb and he looks around at all of you and goes hey I recognize all of you you're the characters from my favorite books growing up why did you read all the Hans Christian Andersen it's just an odd combination with the, the Winnie the Pooh there I think I died at the end of my book. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I have all of the information of the entire internet stuck in my brain ever since I got sucked into cyberspace. Mmm, yes. This cyberspace sounds very cyber. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty wild. Well, you know what? I think there's obviously some sort of nefarious plot going on here. The librarian here at Harry Connick Junior High School is a huge stickler, Miss Athmulstrum. And she would never let anybody stay stuck inside of the library. And so obviously there's some kind of nefarious plot going on. If all these books are coming to life, I imagine there might be some villain out there who's doing this. <sighs> and it might be our job to stop him. Ned, I like to think uh, as I came out of my book, I tried to do like a very performance-like leap but maybe my tail like caught hold of like the page that I came out of. And so there's just this been this slow trickle of water coming out of the book. Uh, and so like this, this water starts pooling around our feet and it just seems to get more and more. Yeah, what's the current wetness factor? Cause I'm not sure if I have fins or feet at this moment. Uh, it's getting pretty high up. Like the f books are starting to float up around you. Um, I guess as far, there's only one there are no humans here technically for size reference, <laughs> but Freakazoid is the closest thing to a human. So it's currently up to about Freakazoid's chest and beginning to kind of reach his armpits. And he looks around and he's like, oh goodness, we're in a bit of trouble here. Perhaps we should build a raft or something. Don't worry guys, I can breathe underwater and Moby probably can too. Half of us will make it out of this alive. <laughs> well, uh, funny thing that, I uh, <clears throat> I usually like to hover around the surface and um, because I do that, I don't need to breathe underwater very often. So um, a raft sounds dandy just about now. He's a whale. Whales breathe air. Oh, all right. Well, uh, I guess I'm overruled. Let's build a raft. Uh, I'm going to find a library shelf and just start knocking it over. Maybe that'll help. All right. Go ahead and roll to overcome with forceful. Okay. 
That is a plus one. <laughs> All right. So you go and you start tipping over the bookshelf and it's full of these soggy books. Like the covers are barely able to contain the pages as they're starting to soak and expand. And you're like trying to tip this over, but you're not the most muscly individual. And as you tip it, it doesn't go exactly where you want it to. It starts to do like a domino effect, hitting all of these bookshelves, going all around the library. And as they do, it begins to generate this massive circular current in the water and a whirlpool begins to form at the very center of the library. Well, I give up. Does anybody else have any good ideas? Because uh, this is what happens when I try. Hey, you don't need to be so down on yourself, my friend. We'll get you out of here. And I will bounce up to the upper levels and start chucking down like chairs and other small shelves and anything that I could use to, you know, build some stairs to get to higher ground. All right, yeah, roll to overcome with clever. That's a whopping plus two. All right, yeah. So you start gathering as much debris and detritus together as you can, and you start lashing it together into a raft. And the whirlpool is pulling you guys all in towards the center, but just at the very last minute, you manage to get like the final cord pulled and you all hop on top of the raft as it continues to go down, down, down the whirlpool. And you can see at the bottom of the whirlpool where you might expect to see darkness instead, you can see light at the very bottom of it. Guys, I know water magic and that looks like a p -p -p portal to me. Thought you were gonna burst into song there. <laughs> Not every mermaid sings. Okay, that's kind of offensive. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm just desperately uh, clutching to uh, Dexter now Freakazoid. Yeah, he is Freakazoid currently. For sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm clutching on to Freakazoid going oh, 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 and just yelling at the top of my lungs. And eventually the whirlpool sucks you all the way down to the bottom and gravity shifts suddenly as you are no longer going down, but you are instead spewed out high into the air. And you look around you and as you start to get a, your bearings on what's happening here, you can see you're above the open ocean, just water as far as the eye can see, clouds on the horizon, the sun just beginning to set. And far below you, you can see just one single boat that is sailing in the middle of this ocean and you all begin falling back down towards the water, all of these individuals. There's a massive whale, and just because I need to get in an obscure literary reference, there's also a bowl of petunias falling alongside the whale. <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> hey, what is this? What is this? I think I'll call it air. I'll call it air right now. <laughs> oh, so good. And as you watch this flat thing coming up to meet you, maybe I'll call it ground. No, wait, that's not ground. That's water. You all splash down into the water. Uh, the raft kind of bobs to the top. And so we've got Tigger and Freakazoid up on top of there. And Ari and Moby, you're kind of treading water next to it. And you hear from far off in the distance from that boat a voice call out, There she blows, mates! Let's go get him. I've not seen that white whale in years and I want me leg back. Oh my, everybody. Wait um, a second, are you the giant white whale these guys are always screaming about? <laughs> Did you really take his leg? Uh, we appear to be in a little bit of what I like to call a pickle. Um, <laughs> yes, we do best to swim far away from that boat, probably. <laughs> well, I could probably hide us at my dad's place, but I don't even know if we're in the right ocean. And also, I don't know if half you guys can breathe underwater. So uh, let's just start moving this way and see if we can get some distance between these fellas. Hey, Ned, how far away is this ship? Uh, the ship is about 50. Uh, it's about... It's about five nautical unit measurements. <laughs> of course. Yes. The universal measurement that everybody knows. Of course. Yes. And as this ship begins sailing towards you, you hear Captain Ahab call out, It's a good thing we outfitted this ship with some highly technologically advanced gunfare recently. <laughs> and you look at the ship that he's piloting. And from the sides, the cannon ports open up. And instead of just cannons that stick out, you see these large mechanical like Gatling turrets come out towards you. <laughs> Good heavens, they've really upgraded since last I saw them. <laughs> I think I really liked his leg. 
and Captain Ahab turns towards the man standing next to him and says, Dr. Frankenstein, I'm so glad you decided to start getting into the weapons industry instead of, like, weird necromancy stuff. My, you must have paid an arm and leg for that armament. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he calls out and he's like, I resent that so much right now. They doubled their speed. Let's go, guys. <laughs> yeah, and as they start shooting towards you guys on your raft, Freakazoid turns to the camera and says, it looks like we're in trouble now. Dun, dun, dun. And there's like a circle iris wipe as we go to the credits. And we're going to have to figure out what happens next week in the world of the illiterates. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to Improv Tabletop this week. And we'll be back next week with more adventures in the world of the illiterates. If you want more, go ahead and subscribe. Maybe even give us a review. We would be as happy as a man who is about to enact revenge on his greatest nemesis if you would go ahead and give us a positive review on the podcatcher of your choice. We're also on Twitter at Improv Tabletop, as well as Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. If you'd like to suggest either a setting for us to play in or an aspect for one of our characters to use, you can tweet about us or comment on one of our posts using hashtag ImpTab setting or hashtag ImpTab aspect. Let's do a round of plugs. As always, we have our sister podcast, I Cast Fireball, in which our new friend Thomas is the dungeon master, runs through a D&D 5e adventure that is going really well so far. So go give that a look. And also, I would like to plug Pepto-Bismol. Uh, I might have had a little bit of mild food poisoning before we started recording, maybe due to the fact that I ate a really bad burrito for lunch, or maybe due to the fact that I ate a plum off a tree that might have been an ornamental flowering plum, uh, or maybe both. Maybe it was both, and I just had a really bad stomach day. But in any case, Pepto-Bismol is the reason why I am recording right now. So thank you, Pepto-Bismol. Not a sponsor. Not a sponsor. Maybe someday. Who knows? Uh, Connor, you got anything to plug? Yeah, I want to plug this book called The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And then I also want to plug these other books called The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen because Tom Sawyer eventually becomes an FBI agent for the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And um, let me tell you, he's not painting fences anymore. Now he's shooting people with Winchester rifles. <laughs> that exists. Comic books rule. That's that's my plug. Yeah, just like how Elvis became an FBI agent. Thank <laughs> exactly. you. Good old Richard Nixon. Friend of the podcast, Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> Returning character and possible time god, Richard Nixon. <laughs> Ricky, we love you, man. Uh, Caleb, what you got to plug? Guys, I hope that all this water has you thinking about taking a bath. If you do, <laughs> take a bath. Take a bath with some soap that my wife made at bookloversoaps.com. She's got literary-based soap for people who like books, and I'm hoping you like books because we like books and we're doing a literary campaign. Go get some good soap. That segue was 10 out of 10. Thank you. And if there was ever a time to plug book-themed soaps, it's right now. It's right freaking now. <laughs> Thomas, you got anything you'd like to plug? Well, I do have this other podcast, uh, I Cast Fireball. It is a fantasy 5e D&D adventure. Um, and I also want to plug my wife's store, Be Wired Jewelry. She's got really cool, I would say classic or antique or some might even say fantasy themed type jewelry, earrings, pendants, necklaces, rings, things like that. I love them to death and she is so crazy talented. You can go look her up at B, the letter B, Wired Jewelry on Instagram or Pinterest. And yeah, she's got some amazing stuff. Right on. Well, thank you all for joining us here in the world of the illiterates. I'm Ned Wilcock, your host and GM, and I've been joined by... Connor Wood, the one who definitely knows how to read. Caleb Anderton, the one who's probably also illiterate. And Thomas Bauer, the one who's about to be shot with a Gatling gun. <laughs> <laughs> Much love and stuff. We'll catch you next week on Improv Tabletop. Mm -hmm.